you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We are walking through the book of Revelation, and again, you know, when you pick, when I picked Revelation, you know, I had no idea that the last two weeks we would be talking about Satan attacking Israel, and uh, God just, uh, he knows what he's doing. Uh, we are in the very midst of that. And uh, I just want to say this, um, you have to realize, folks, that God is in control of everything, okay? He knows what he's doing. He knows what's going to happen. Israel will be right in the middle of it. And I'll point out at least two things today uh, that will show uh, the God's, God's sovereignty and uh, God in the middle of everything. And here's the second thing I want to tell you. You cannot believe everything you see or hear on TV or on the Internet. Okay? Basically, if you can pay for it, you can get on and you can practice your freedom of speech. So before you start popping off about things, you need to think that through, okay? I, I've twice this week, you know, it took every bit of my being not to tell somebody you are dead wrong about what you just said, okay? And I, I don't like conflict. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't have that preacher era that I have to be right and everybody else is wrong, okay? Because there's so much symbolism in the book of Revelation. And I'm simply saying, you need to pray for Israel. Israel will get through this. Israel will do exactly what God says it needs to do. And when it all says, said, and done, we will be in the millennium. Uh, Phil will be in Jerusalem there those thousand years. And all this other junk ain't going to matter, okay? That's right. All right. I feel better now. <laughs> Amen. The tax on Israel. Y'all help me. Y'all help me when you listen, okay? If you have a bulletin and want to follow along here, number one, attack one. This is not a hard outline, okay? <laughs> Some of you just got that, all right? The first one is attack one. The second one is attack two. And you want to guess what the third one is? <laughs> attack three. Folks, we need some humor. I know you can overdo humor, but we need some humor. We need some joy in our life. I'd rather see you smile than I would the way some of you look some of the time. <laughs> I'm thinking you had dill pickle juice with your eggs, okay? And I'm glad you're eating eggs, but I'm simply saying life is too short. And I will say this, it's getting shorter. Amen. If, I had, I, if I were you and I did not know where I was going when I die, I would seriously consider the message that we will hear today. Folks, I am telling you, our redemption draweth nigh. And we need to understand that the stuff in the Scripture that we are reading will come to fruition. It's going to happen. And so, you know, over all the history of the Jews, uh, they have faced more hatred and persecution than any other people on earth. Satan has been the cause of much of Israel's suffering. He has tried to eliminate the Jewish race through several bloodthirsty and ungodly leaders. The one that sticks out right now is Hitler, and over six million Jews were slaughtered. The Bible warns that the greatest suffering of Israel will be, the wor will be the worst they have ever seen. During the Great Tribulation, Satan will make his last desperate attempt to prevent the, pro uh, the promised reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on Israel's throne to happen. And in Zechariah 13, verse 8, it simply says prophetically that in the last days, in the tribulation times, two-thirds of the Jewish population will be eliminated. You figure out, folks, you do the math. It's going to be a, a lot of people. And he will assault the Jewish people, uh, both those who have been saved during the tribulation and the lost Jews, just because they're Jewish. Folks, I hope we as Christians have got by this, the color of someone's skin. All right? We're in America, folks. It's the melting pot. In, and I understand they need to come in illegally. I'm, I mean, illegally. <laughs> illegally, okay? <laughs> They need to come in the right way. But folks, their soul is what matters. 
Everyone, everywhere needs Jesus Christ. There's no doubt in my mind, and we need to treat everyone as Jesus would treat them. As the Antichrist comes to power, he will first make peace with Israel. But halfway through the tribulation, everything will change, and he will try to destroy Israel. Our text today describes three attacks on Israel. Let's look at this prophetic scripture together. Revelation 12, verse 13. Attack one. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to earth, which we covered last week, and uh, by the way, we are, uh, Bill has gotten uh, all the revelation that I preach, and it's all going to be in one place. And uh, what was that? Spotify. Spotify. I don't know what Spotify is. <laughs> but, you know, he's got it to where if you missed anything, you can go to that and, and, and catch up on all the sermons that we have preached on Revelation. And when the dragon saw that he'd been cast to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. And we know from last week the dragon is Satan. We know the woman is Israel. And we know the male child is Jesus. All right? These are the three main characters in our Scripture today. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half time from the presence of the serpent. And folks, Satan will turn on Israel. So we know it's the start of the second part of the tribulation uh, uh, that, that we have read in uh, Revelation. And it will be a devastating time for Israel. Folks, I am telling you, because he got kicked out of heaven, if you remember the last words of what we studied last week, his time is short. The persecution will be the worst of any of the persecutions that we have seen and the judgments that we have seen. So he is mad, he is upset, and he is trying to destroy and eliminate Israel when all this is going on. And what, the, what, what we talked about even before in chapters before that Israel will have to run. Remember in Matthew chapter 24, we read last week where it just describes how in a moment, all right, when, when the Antichrist comes on the scene and all that starts happening and Satan is ruling, reigning, they will just have shortness of time. The Israel will have to leave to keep from being killed. And, and he is saying that, uh, and folks, what you have to understand is Israel has always been, you know, uh, sought out. Uh, you can go back to the Pharaohs, and you can go back to Moses' time. Matter of fact, hold your finger there and go to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. And I like to weave Old Testament with New Testament. I think it's very, very important that we do that because Old Testament is prophetic scriptures of things to come. That's how I know the Bible is true. Everything that has happened in the Old Testament, every prophecy that has happened has come true in the New Testament. And we know here, the, the, it's talking about the song of Moses. And Moses was going back over everything Israel had been through. And folks, even when God was chastising them, even when they were serving other gods, God was always there for them. Hebrews 13, 5 says, He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Folks, I know where God is, and I've heard this. Well, where's God in all this? He's right where he's been. He's in heaven. He's in control. He's watching over his people. Look in verse 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you, and your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, and when he separated the sons of Adam, he set boundaries of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's per portion is his people. Israel is God's chosen people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him 
He instructed him, and he kept him as the apple of his eye. And of course, Jacob is talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. And folks, we know what the apple of our eye is, all right? Uh, Mine personally is Kylie, all right? I love Keegan, but I'm telling you, me and Kylie, Kylie, we're tight, all right? (laughs) As an eagle stirred up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings and taking them up, carrying them on wings so that the Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign God with him. And again, here, the Old Testament uses the word eagle, and the very same word is used in the New Testament for eagle. And I'll explain that a little more in just a few minutes. So we know the wings are God's protection over Israel. And we know when, when birds have eggs, they, they you know, hover around that nest. They protect that nest. The mother sits on the eggs. The mother takes them under the wings, and they follow them uh, you know, till they are able to get out of the nest on their own. And folks, that's what God does for Israel. Nothing you know, catches him by surprise. Everything is calculated, and in the end, I am telling you, God will win, and Israel will shine. Psalm 57. Psalm 57. Go with me. Psalm 57. Verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful, for my soul trusts in you. Folks, you trusted God for salvation. We need to keep trusting him in all situations in life. And in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me, and he shall send from heaven and save me. Folks, he even has angels. I believe that every person has a guardian angel. And I believe that God sends angels to protect us. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. And my soul is among lions. And you see some of these symbolic things are lions, and we know that lions are ferocious, and we know that lions are are aggressive. And you see the word lions all through the book of Revelation. And it says, I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, there's no panic in heaven right now. All right? And and this week, two, three times, you know, when I saw people or talked to people, They all have said the same thing. All three of these people said, I cannot wait for the rapture of the church. Folks, when you think about what heaven's going to be like, it will be totally tranquil. It'll be peace. It'll be a wonder, wonderful, wonderful place. And they have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit for me. And to the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake my glory. Awake lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. Folks, I don't know about you, but Sunday is my favorite day of the week. We go through Monday through Saturday, and you know there's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of bad news. There are a lot of things, uh, even bad things that happen to good people. But there's just something about coming to church, coming into the sanctuary of God that gives me peace and it encourages me. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. 
So even in a time, and you, you have to understand an eagle, there's three characteristics of an eagle. One is strength. Okay, one is strength. God is strength. But He will give His children strength also. The second thing an eagle does is they, they fly fast. Okay, there's speed there. There's a lot of speed. And folks, I am telling you, nothing's going to get out ahead of God. Nothing's going to run behind God. These are characteristics. And the third thing is protection. Is protection. We are under the divine protection of God. Folks, I am not going to die one second before my assigned time. God knew my birth, and God knows the day I will die. And I'm telling you, I have no death wish whatsoever. I love my job, I love my family, and I love my church. But that day it happens. I'm just telling you, folks, you're going to see one man smile a big smile. Amen. Why? And folks, all I want to hear my Lord say is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Well, folks, God's in heaven. He's in control. Even though war breaks out, even though people seem hopeless right now, even though people uh, have fear, fear, and always, always is one of my favorite songs, period. Okay, I love that song. Do not be afraid. And here it says, they will go, they will go from the presence of the serpent. So they will have to flee for their lives. They will have to go and hide from the evil one, Satan's presence, and the Antichrist. So we see attack one there, and there is also attack two. Look in verse 15. Look in verse 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he may cause her to be carried away by the flood. And there are several interpretations of this serpent spewing water out. Uh, you know, some say that it is literal, okay, that, that Satan somehow uh, can make it, you know, storm in the desert. Okay, to where there's literally floods in the desert. And uh, we know what floods can do, folks. Floods destroy. Uh, we've had several uh, times, you know, uh, the Arkansas River uh, just came, you know, out of its banks. And, you know, in the low-lying areas, people lost everything, their homes. And we have seen that, uh, how devastating a flood can be. But that's, that's you know... I mean, that is possible, but in my opinion, that's not what he's talking about. I believe he's talking about an army of people, all right? An army of people, okay? And just like the Old Testament days, Israel has been in this situation before. Uh, when I think of the story of Moses, and he was, you know, kept telling you know, Pharaoh, let my people go. Let my people go. And he finally let them go. And they get in the wilderness, and they come across the Red Sea. You have Pharaoh's army coming at them, and you, you have them uh, somewhere around 2 million people at the Red Sea. And they looked up, and, you know, they were whining about, Moses, you're, you, you know, you brought us out here so they could kill us. But Moses kept trying to tell them, God is going to take care of us. I've listened to God. I've listened to the instructions of God. And we know what happened, folks. God, with His power, with the miracles that He does, parted the water and, and the children of Israel walked over on dry land. And I heard a person one time say, well, I heard there was six inches of water in there. It wasn't just, you know, dry land. And I said, well, that's pretty amazing. That many people and all of them died in six inches of water. All right. Because folks, there's some people who just knock. It doesn't matter what you read in the Bible. They don't believe it. But folks, I believe the Bible. And I believe when they looked up and they were going over, they literally saw walls of water. 
and they got on the other side. And when that last one, his feet crossed over into land, God took care of them. And God let the water go, and they drowned, all of them, according to the Word of God. Folks, that's what the history of Israel shows us. And another example uh, in, in, in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 16. Numbers 16. I want you to go there with me. Numbers chapter 16. And there was a rebellion against Moses and Aaron, uh, Korah, uh, the son of Issachar, and three men basically went against Moses. And, what, and you can read the first part uh, of chapter 16 later today, but basically what they were saying was, we don't like the way you're running things. We don't like the way you're doing things. Who put you in charge? Who put you in charge? And so there's this conversation with Moses. And Moses, you know, he really did get tired of people whining about what was going on. It was like, things are good. Things are great. We got out of Egypt. And then, you know, three days later, uh, they griped about the food. They griped about being thirsty. They griped about, why are we getting the same quail? Well, listen, if you were in a desert and you were hungry, you know, you would eat, you'd eat quail seven days a week, all right? So all this had been going on, and he basically said, and I'm just paraphrasing this, you guys get ready. We are going to stand before the Lord, and we are going to let the Lord judge, okay? And folks, you have to understand, God is a fair judge. God knows who's right and who's wrong. God knows when people are just being mean and people are challenging His uh, appointed ones and his anointed ones. And folks, I'm just telling you, you need to watch. You need to watch what you say to people, and you, you especially those who are in charge, uh, his anointed ones, you need, to, you, you need to listen to the voice of God uh, in cases like this. And basically he said, get them together, okay? You, you gather your people and I, me and Aaron and our people will be there too. And so I want to pick this up, and uh, all this was going on. In verse 28 it says, And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all the works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or are they visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected God. And that's what he is saying here. Moses just saying, man, I know what's right. I know what God has told me. We are doing the right thing. But a group of 250 men and these three leaders went against Moses. And so there was the challenge there. Now look at verse 31. Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, and all the men with Korah with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from among them and among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were, uh, who were offering incense. And folks, God showed his power there. I mean, could you imagine being there and witnessing that? You know, folks standing around in tents and discussing, and it was also, you know, Moses on one side and Korah and his folks on the other side. And all at once, you see a crack in the earth, and that crack runs right towards Korah and their men. And it gets wider, and it gets wider, and it gets wider, and it, the earth literally swallows them up. Folks, our 
God can do anything. He can do anything. Look back here in verse 16. But the earth helped the woman, Israel, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And folks, I believe uh, the flood was probably an army, and I believe that God took care of Israel in that way. And there was a lot of questions about which way they left, when they left Jerusalem, when they left the promised land, which way they go. And again, I'm just telling you in my opinion, they, they went east because the land, it was a mountainous area. And you can hide better there because really, you talk about a death sentence. Basically, Satan and the Antichrist, when he turned and, and he said, I want them all dead. Every Jew that you can find, I want dead. You know, they had to flee. And I believe the Antichrist would kill every one of them if they found them and if they could get to them. And then it says in verse 17, the attack one, the attack two, and the attack three, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. Now folks, notice uh, every time his, his plans are spoiled, he gets more angry. He is enraged. That means out of control, okay? He goes crazy, all right? And it says, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring. So what happened before was he was just after the Jews themselves at first, okay? Then uh, he, you know, the Christian Jews, and basically what he's saying about the offspring, anybody that was a Christian in that day, Jew or Gentile, anybody that was a Christian, he was after. He was after. And again, we, it, it just tells you uh, how harsh the Antichrist is will be, and it tells you things that are coming. It will be even worse. Then it says, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ Jesus. Folks, that tells us two things. And the application is that we need to be doing in our own personal lives. We need to keep the commandments of God. And it's not just the Ten Commandments. Folks, it's all the Word of God. Everything, the Bible, we, it, it is our guide. It is truth. It is divinely inspired. It is inerrant. It is perfect. It is our instructions. Folks, that's why it's so important that you read the Bible. And not just read the Bible. You need to study His commandments. He talks about turning the other cheek. Jesus speaks about that. There was some... You know, you know, sometimes Jesus would say, this is what you guys say, but this is what I say. I'll tell you one that we really struggle with, all right? Love your enemies. Folks, you can only love your enemies through the life of Jesus Christ. Seeing things from God's point of view. And folks, there are people, Scott, you and I were talking about this the other day, one of the things, jihad, when they declared, you know, open season, all right, you see them, you kill them type stuff. These are the same guys that put bombs on themselves and go in places and blows themselves up, okay? And what we were talking about, and we're not glorifying this in any stretch or any way, but they have to have a total belief in what they're doing to do that. They believe it, even though it's a lie, even though it's not going to get make them better in the next world, because that's not in the Word of God. But yet, God tells us, one of His commandments is, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And folks, we need to be actively witnessing the truth of God. We need to be willing to lay our lives down for Christ. We need to be so serious about these end times that we are on our knees and we are praying for Israel. And we, were, and we are asking for God's protection upon Israel and all those folks that are going on. Because it's just like this 
lady and the daughter that got cut loose? I mean, somebody had asked me, well, why them? Well, folks, it's the sovereignty of God. It is God. They, they were the ones that were blessed and got released. So, so we see these things going on. We see that Satan is going to be after every Christian. All right, He's going to be hunting them down during this time. And we need to understand what is going on. We need to still obey the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we know the testimony of Christ is all in the, two, uh, the, the New Testament. Hey, why don't you go back sometime this week and read the Beatitudes? The Beatitudes? Why don't you go and you look at them carefully about what Jesus said, blessed are. Read them slowly. And folks, we need to apply these to our, uh, to our lives. Psalm 83. Psalm 83. You talk about a psalm about today. You have to realize how long ago Psalm 83 was written, folks. Psalm 83, a direct prophecy about Israel. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult. And those who hate you have lifted up their heads. They have taken, they have taken crafty counsel against your people, against Israel, and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have, cut, they have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. Now, folks, that is exactly what is going on right now. Right now. It's not just land, folks. It is elimination of people, and it's God's chosen people. Verse 5, for they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagarites, Jebel, Ammon, Amalek, uh, Philistia, Tyre, and Assyria. You want to guess how many nations that is? Ten. What's going to happen in Revelation? During the battle of Armageddon, ten nations are going to go against Jesus. And I'm just telling you, God and Jesus will destroy these nations. And again, I'm not saying these are the ones for sure that will be there in the end, but it's simply that number just amazed me uh, 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 how that, that you know, lined up with that. Now look at verse 9. Deal with them as Median, as with Syria, as with Syria, uh, Jabin, the brook of Kishnah, uh, Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zed. Yes, all their princesses like Zeba and Zamilla, who said, let us take for ourselves the pastors of God for a possession. Folks, I'm telling you, when the Israelites came in, you know, and they started, uh, you know, conquering the land, God was there. You know, I think of the walls of Jericho, all right? You know, you look at that on paper, and you're just thinking, we're just going to march around it? We're just going to march? You're going to make us seven times? You know how much that would make my feet hurt? I mean, they'd be griping about it. And then we're going to just shout, and the walls are going to come tumbling down. I know somebody in that meeting room said, Josh, you're crazy, man. What's wrong with you? Folks. Our God can do anything. Verse 13, oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind. As the fire burns the woods and the flame sets mountains on fire, so pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish that they may know that you, whose name alone is Lord, are the most high over the earth. That's what he's saying. Then Psalm, 20, Psalm 27, and I close with this. Folks, don't fear. Man, do not fear what's going on. God's got this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. 
Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumble and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me, this I will be confident. The one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will see, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He should hide me, and he shall set me on a rock. Oh, folks, we serve a mighty God. We serve a God that loves you. And if you are here today, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I pray today would be your day of salvation. If you're here today, and man, you've been worrying. You know, we don't need to worry, folks. We need to have faith. We need to replace worry with faith and trust that God is in control of all situations. Folks, we know who wins. God will win. Father, thank you for the day. and God, I thank you for prophecy. God, I thank you that you've just spelled it out for us. We are walking through future times. The very thing that's going on in Israel has not caught you by surprise. And God, we do pray for Israel. God, we pray your protection upon them. And God, I just pray, Lord, that uh, people would see that they're not, they don't have a lot of time. God, I pray that if they're not sure they're going to go to heaven, God, I pray they would come talk to one of us. God, your word can help them. Your word is truth. It is yes, and it is amen. So God, we give you this invitation. God, it's for you. It's for you. And God, I pray that you would just convict hearts. And God, I pray that people just do the will of God. God, thank you for this time that we have together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?